this evening is not about trying to do the entire ring cycle or... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you bring sleeping bags? <laughs> I don't even know if we'll cover every detail. <laughs> but just by immersing yourselves a little bit more in this, you will always remember it. And the next time you hear the ring, 15 hours of it with orchestra or in an HD broadcast or however you may next hear it, if you ever choose to hear it again, um, you will remember things. And, and because of that, you will enjoy it even more. Uh, it's one of the greatest works of art in Western civilization, and it's uh, deep enough that it is incomprehensible, and I mean that in a positive way. <laughs> you, you never fully grasp what this piece is about, but I think uh, we should just start right in. So you're all going to be the River Rhine. <laughs> all right? Now, the good thing about the River Rhine is that it flows on for about three minutes at the beginning of the opera with no key change at all. So if you just find a note that you like that's in the chord, <laughs> you'll be okay. If you want to change nodes, go along with the tune, some of you know the ring better than others. Probably some of you aren't really clear on the whole story, so um, I'm going to sort of tell the story as we sing our way through the ring. <laughs> now, the, the Rhine, if you didn't know this, is in E flat. <laughs> it flows in this key. Yeah. You better shut your eyes. There's a lot of uh, a lot of water out there. are three lovely mermaids or Nixon or water spirits, and they are the Rhine Maidens. Uh, not surprisingly, the music of the Rhine Maidens sounds sort of like the music of the Rhine, and it flows along in the same meter but in a different key. Um, without glasses, though. <laughs> It would be very, very watery, yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's what happens. Uh, throughout the evening, la, la, da, 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 all those things are just fine. But um, if, if sometimes you're moved to use uh, words and syllables, the Rhine maidens start out singing words that aren't of any language. They're, they're in Rhine language. Yes. They, they sing va la la, va la la, la la la, ya, la ya, la ya, la ya, hi ya, hi ya, ha hi ya. Va la la. Lovely, lovely, lovely. You, you don't have to be so um, restrained and shy, you know. <laughs> at, at Bayreuth, the tradition is that everybody has to sit there absolutely. St How many of you have been to Bayreuth? Yoko, you've been to Bayreuth. All right. Now, as you know, except for the stage, you don't hear a pin drop. So uh, that's, that's the way they do it, but we don't want to do it that way. We're, <laughs> we're going to say, I believe that Wagner, who felt that everybody in the world would benefit from being as involved with his works as possible, um, <laughs> if he had known that he could have had the audience singing along at Bayreuth, he would have done it. But he didn't live long enough, and his grandchildren didn't get the message. So <laughs> we're going to just sing, OK? Um, the Rhine maidens are undisturbed. They're immortal. And the Rhine represents more than just the Rhine, but all of nature. So in the Rhine, there is gold. Not just ordinary gold, but Rhine gold, primeval gold. You've probably heard that before. <laughs> Thank you. 
and the Rhine maidens are swimming around playing, and their job is to guard this Rhine gold, but they don't have to guard it very much because it's underwater and there's nobody down there. But <laughs> today, a dwarf enters the Rhine, not from the top, but from the bottom. He lives underground, and he comes essentially to flirt with the Rhine maidens, and uh, they think that he's ugly and funny looking, so they swim and tease him, but suddenly the sun hits the Rhine gold, and he discovers something that heretofore nobody has really known, which is that the Rhine treasure is sitting right there. However, the Rhine maidens say, a person like you could never seize the gold of the Rhine because Obviously, you're a lusty old dwarf and you're, you're thinking about catching one of us, but the person who steals the Rhine gold, if that were ever to happen, would have to renounce love forever. Now, if you were a smart Rhine maiden, you probably wouldn't be giving this information away <laughs> at all. But these girls don't have a lot of people to talk to, so not only... <laughs> Not only do they say that, they then say, of course, if somebody did steal the uh, Rhine gold, they would be able to fashion a helmet, a tarn helm, that would enable them to assume any shape, and much more important, they would be able to make a ring that would give them power and dominance over the universe. So this little dwarf, <laughs> whose name is Alberich, is unable to catch the Rhine maidens and thinks maybe as an ugly dwarf there would be more value in dominating the universe. <laughs> and so guess what? He steals the Rhine gold and takes it down into the Nibelungen's land, which is below the Rhine. And uh, pretty soon he has enslaved all of the Nibelungen to start turning the gold into the treasures that have been promised him. Now, in another part of the universe, this is the music that represents the potential of the ring. Want to give that a shot? leads us to Oh, you've seen this movie before. Valhalla. Valhalla, the home of the eternal immortal gods. Valhalla has had a sort of cottage and Wotan, Odin, Woden, the head of the gods, has been persuaded by his wife that they should replace the cottage with a splendid palace. And Wotan has agreed to this. In order to build the palace, he's hired two giants who come from Riesenheim, Fafner and Fasolt. So the giants build, you don't have to remember all this. <laughs> but the giants are capable of building this splendid, magnificent palace for Valhalla. And the purpose of Valhalla, after all, is that all of the heroes who are slain nobly in battle are carried up to Valhalla and so Wotan wants to have a suitable home for these heroes. His wife, Fricka, has an entirely different motive. <laughs> Fricka feels that if Wotan has a nice place, he won't go around so much. Uh, we all know that Wotan has gone to every corner of the world and had thousands and thousands of children, whether he's in disguise or not, and, and that this is just part of Wotan's life. 
Fricka doesn't like this part of Wotan's <laughs> life. So the two of them both want Valhalla to be built, but they have different motives. Now the problem is that Wotan is building Valhalla with no cash. <laughs> he does not have a plan how he's going to pay the giants. He has rather rashly promised that Freya, the goddess of beauty and youth, will be the trade-off. He's going to give the giants Freya in exchange for Valhalla. <laughs> now Freya is not just another pretty goddess. She is responsible for bringing golden apples to the gods every day, and by eating these apples, the gods stay eternally young. So it would be a really bad plan to have the giants <laughs> take fry. Okay, so now we're going to continue. Wotan carries a spear. You already get he's a little bit fast and loose with the rules of the universe. Um, he made them, but the rules in this opera are then he has to follow them. So what he did is he carved a piece from the world ash tree. There's a, there's a tree upon which the world sits. And Wotan took a big branch and made a spear out of it. And he carves runes in this spear, and these magic runes are laws that cannot be broken, including by Wotan himself. Now Wagner, as you've noticed, a lot of the motifs you've been singing are very much based on arpeggios, you know, these things, as opposed to scales, those things. So for Wagner, anything that's deep and primordial and part of nature is an arpeggio, like the Rhine that you sang, or Valhalla, or the uh, Rhine Maidens. But Wotan's spear is always represented by a scale. And the point of all this is that things that are man-made, things that are imposed on the universe, are not uh, in that universal harmony, but instead... So, Frequently in the opera, we'll hear motifs that clash with the flowing harmony of the universe imposed by some kind of consciousness. I can't say human because the gods aren't really human, but of course in this opera the gods really are human. The gods are uh, eternal humans whose um, lusts and desires and foibles are god-sized. They're, they're just humans with even bigger problems that live forever. <laughs> so, Wotan is, is busy trying to figure out how he's going to solve this problem because even he sees that it was not a good idea. And the giants show up demanding Freya. You can sing the giants. <laughs> It's boring, but do it. <laughs> they're, they're very big and they sing very loud. <laughs> exactly, that's good. So the giants are giants of honor. They're not going to force anything out of Wotan, but they expect their payment. And Wotan is trying to think how he can weasel out of this situation. Luckily for Wotan, at this moment, who shows up but Loge? Loge, the god of fire, is not really a full god. And so the gods don't treat him well. He doesn't get to eat the apples. And he is always off on some mischievous mission. But Loge is much more crafty than any of the other gods and he always seems to have an insight into how he can use human nature to turn things his way. So Loge's music is uh, always chromatic. Chromatic means the notes that are right next to each other. And um, he, he is the... Um, so Loge uh, says casually in front of the giants, oh, I hear that the Rheingold has just been stolen, and um, I think that whoever is able to take possession of it can gain control of the universe. And so the giants say, stop a moment. 
Maybe we don't want Freya. <laughs> and Wotan rather rashly says, oh, well, we'll give you the Rheingold. Well, of course, he doesn't have the Rheingold, <laughs> but, but he promises it nevertheless. And so the giants say, okay, we'll give you a day and we'll come back. And uh, if you have the Rheingold, then we'll take that as a <coughs> payment for building Valhalla for you. So the giants go away. And the great thing about the ring is that even though it's 15 hours long, once you know the main motifs, five minutes won't go by that you won't hear one of them. And so you're engaged in a way that it's very difficult to remain engaged for 15 hours of totally new music. Um, that's just the value of <laughs> getting to hear it more than once. So, where are we in our story? Um, all right, so Loge is um, telling about the Rheingold. This motif is Rheingold, Rheingold. That's the, the name of the first opera, Das Rheingold, the gold in the Rhine. Uh, we have heard the Rhine maiden sing that earlier and higher in the opera. <laughs> But Loga is not a soprano, so he's, he's singing about it. So uh, Loga is, of course, enticing not just the giants, but Wotan. Wotan would like to have even more control than being the supreme being of the universe. And so he thinks he wants that ring uh, for himself. Now, Loga is concocting a plan. How are they gonna go down to Nibelheim, where the Nibelungs live, and get that ring? Well, we go down to Nibelheim, and you can hear all the dwarves on their anvils banging with their hammers. Yeah, you can use your jewelry or <laughs> anything that's not really breakable. And, um, So in comes uh, Alberich. Now remember, Alberich is the dwarf who stole the gold in the first place. And he is now the master of everyone. Because not only can he, with the Tarnhelm, make himself into any form, large or small, but he can make himself completely invisible. And he himself had the ring forged. So at, just to be clear, at the beginning of the ring, there is no ring. The ring doesn't exist until Alberich has it made. Even though the potential of the ring is there, it's unrealized. So by now, the ring exists and it gives power, absolute power, to the person who holds it. But it won't surprise you to know that nobody can hold it because anybody who holds the ring and the absolute power that goes with it is destroyed. So Alberich has the ring, Loge and Wotan come to him, they say, oh, incredible that you have all of this power. Show us what you can do. And Alberich turns himself into a gigantic dragon. And Loga says, oh my God, that's terrifying. But is it possible that even a small creature can be emulated with the power of the ring? And in order to demonstrate this, Alberich turns himself into a little toad. And Wotan and Loga capture him and they take him back to Valhalla and they collect all the treasure. Now, you might say this is unscrupulous behavior for gods, really, because <laughs> it isn't theirs, but nevertheless, they feel that because Alberich is a miserable dwarf that they need this, and plus they have to have the treasure to pay off the giants so that they don't give up Freya and die. So, up they go, they take Alberich as their prisoner with them, back to um, Valhalla, and uh, 
I did a really good job figuring out how to do this story in 45 minutes. <laughs> OK, so um, he says, uh, if Albrecht can't do anything. He's powerless. But he says, the ring which I had made uh, has the power to do whatever I command it to, even though you have now taken me prisoner. And I command it to curse you so that you shall never be happy. Whoever does not have the ring will always desire it, and whoever does possess it will always be miserable. And that curse proves to be true. So um, remember, we sang that Rheingold theme, and it went after Albrecht utters his curse, that, that turns into minor. Can you hear how that's the same thing? Instead of that, it becomes. So Albrecht goes, and uh, the gods are left feeling not so good about the curse, but really good that they're about to pay off the giants. Now the giants come. They begin to pile up the gold. And the giants say, OK, we have an idea. If you can completely conceal Freya with the gold, then it's enough. They have completely concealed Freya. But then Fasold says, I see some of her hair. And he spots the Tarnhelm. And he says, you have to give me that. And so reluctantly, Wotan puts the Tarnhelm on the pile of gold. And they're about to go off when suddenly one teeny glimmer of Freya peeks through. And of course, they end up having to give the giants the ring. The giants go off with their gold. The gods have Freya back. And the story could end there. But of course, it doesn't. <laughs> because <laughs> there are a lot of reasons why it doesn't. Fafner and Fasolt can't share the ring. Nobody can share absolute power. So within a couple of minutes, Fossil lies dead on the ground, and Fafner takes the ring. Uh, this is what's going to happen with the ring throughout the length of this story. When the gods are left alone, sorry, just one sec here. Um, Wotan says, I'm going to go steal the ring back from Fafner. And out of the earth comes the primordial goddess Erda. Now, Erda has more influence over Wotan than any other god or goddess. He may not like what she says, but he always listens. So when she appears, oh, notice, this is the theme of the Rhine, right? And Erda is the same thing, but in minor. We're just showing how connected she is with everything. And we can actually learn to sing this. The words are weiche Wotan, weiche. All right? Weiche means be careful. It, it means don't go after that ring, it will only bring downfall and destruction to all of you. Weiche, Wotan, Weiche. Now, Wagner wrote all of his own words to all of his operas, but he did not use rhyming. Instead of rhyming, he used alliteration. So lots of times when we do these words, you'll notice they all start with the same, or many of them start with the same sound. Weiche, Wotan, Weiche. So just say that once. Weiche Wotan, Weiche. All right. Weiche Wotan, Weiche. All of us. Weiche Wotan, This is wonderful. You know, <laughs> I probably have told you that when I've conducted in Italy and we're doing Il Trovatore or something, the audience is singing along from beginning to end. But in Wagner, it so rarely happens. <laughs> and you've got to imagine, you know, you're sitting in Seattle or San Francisco or the Met, and some great singer, Stephanie Blythe, is up there singing Weichevo. And from the audience, she hears this rising sound. <laughs> well, it's, it's great. I just think 
There's nothing better than that. Flee des ringes fluch. Fly from the ring's curse. But notice again that alliteration, flee and fluch. So, um, Erda persuades Wotan that at least direct theft of the ring is not a possibility. And at the end of her song, we hear the motif of the end of the gods. So if the origins of nature in Wagner are like this, the reverse of it is the end of the gods and the earth going back to something else. So Wotan accepts this, but being Wotan, he immediately begins to scheme, well, if I can't take the ring, who can I get to take the ring? And he figures out that if somebody who is a completely free-willed being takes the ring and doesn't really have any interest in having it for themselves, that that would be a very convenient way to regain absolute power, which he can tell he's beginning to lose his grasp on. So he has a big plan in mind, which includes having um, some children around uh, the universe to put in place for when he needs them. So uh, he goes, <laughs> he goes down to, uh, to Earth and um, there is, there is uh, a, a woman and um, he disguises himself as Velse. And with this woman he has two children um, and then disappears and uh, the woman is killed by savage barbarians that live nearby to the Velsungs, and um, Wotan is now uh, having a child with Erda. Actually, we don't know how many, but one of them is um, named Brunhilde. And Brunhilde uh, becomes, yeah, that's who Brunhilde's mom is. <laughs> that's why she's so cool. <laughs> Brunhilde is, as Wotan says, his right arm. Everything that passes through his mind, she executes as his will. And Brunhilde and her eight sisters, and we don't know if the eight sisters are different mothers or the same mother, um, fly around the universe on winged horses and collect the warriors who've been valiant in battle and brings them to Valhalla now that it's been built. So Brunhilde is also part of this big plan. All right, on we go. Oh, I'm just going to play you some of this fabulous music because <laughs> uh, Wotan has an idea. Sorry. This idea is going to carry right over into the beginning of the next opera, which is called Die Walküre. Um, Die Walküre are the nine sisters, but at the beginning of the opera, we're in that little part of the world where uh, the Velsungs lived, and Wotan has had these children. Um, we're in a storm. Don't try to sing this. So in, in the middle of all this, we begin to hear um, yeah. which we heard just a minute ago. So heroic deeds are afoot. We just don't know what they are yet. And out of the woods comes a great hero, Siegmund. Now, we don't know yet who Siegmund is, but I'll give you a hint. His father has had tens of thousands of children all <laughs> over the place. <laughs> Siegmund finds a little house, and he goes in because he's been pursued by enemies, and it's the only refuge he can discover in the forest. And 
finally he just sinks down, stretches out in front of their fireplace, and in comes the woman of the household, Sieglinde. Now, Sieglinde has a beautiful leitmotif, which we can all sing. Everybody? And we'll hear hundreds of variations on it. We can tell just from her music that Sieglinde is very feminine, very nurturing, very caring. Um, she sees this poor, handsome, studly tenor, and <laughs> she says, I think I'll take care of him. <laughs> so she gets him something to drink, and um, he begins to tell a little bit about himself, and we hear her theme expand into something. And uh, pretty soon, we hear a music which is the love between these two people who are just meeting for the first time. I just have to play it, it's good stuff. <laughs> Siegmund tells his story about how when he was young, his mother was killed, his father disappeared. Uh, there was a sister, but she has been gone for years and years. And at this moment, in comes, unfortunately, Sieglinde's husband. <laughs> so Sieglinde is in a very unhappy marriage. She was pretty much clubbed on the head and dragged in by her hair. And um, hunding, her, her husband is hunding. Now, hunt in German is a dog. So even sort of implied in his name is that he's not a great hero. Uh, he's, he's just a brutal man. That's hunding, OK? Let's all be hunding for a second. Yes. And he sees this young tenor lying on his hearth, and, and uh, he doesn't like him right away. <laughs> but as he talks to him, he finds out that not only does his instinct tell him that he doesn't like him, but in fact, this young warrior is a mortal enemy of his clan because they were trying to force another woman into marriage, and Sigmund came along and saved her and killed some of Hunding's kinsmen in the process. So Hunding says, hospitality demands that I allow you to stay the night, but in the morning, I will kill you. <laughs> and Siegmund has already made it clear that he doesn't have a weapon. Now, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but uh, Siegmund actually isn't named Siegmund when we meet him. That name, comes in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> so he's singing about himself. And Sieglinde is falling more and more deeply in love with him. But Hunding says, Weib, it's time to go to bed. So he drags her away. And Siegmund is left alone. Now, Siegmund remembers something that his father told him. He says, my father promised me that when I am in the greatest need, there will be a sword for me. This is, um, this is a sword that Wotan himself planted in a tree trunk, which happens to be right by the home of <laughs> <laughs> Hunding and Sieglinde. 
And uh, of course, this is all part of Wotan's master plan. So far, things are working out according to Wotan's master plan. <laughs> so while Sieglinde and Hunding have gone off to bed, um, Sigmund, who's not yet Sigmund, is noticing the hilt of this sword glimmering in the tree. Was glimmert dort hell im Glimmerschein? Welch ein Strahl bricht aus dem Eschestamm? Blinde auch. So he, he sees this and he wonders, could that be uh, what I was promised by my father? So here he is ruminating about the possibility of this sword when Sieglinde reappears. And she says, I gave my husband a really strong drug and he's going to sleep for a long time. <laughs> so she tells a story of how that sword got there. And if you didn't already know who put it there, the music tells you because she's singing Traurig saß ich, während sie tranken, ein Fremder, a stranger, trat da herein, came into the room, and as soon as she says that, the orchestra goes. <laughs> See how good it is that you know these things? So, she's singing about the stranger, and she doesn't exactly know who it was, but she has a little inkling too, because it's her father, um, and Meanwhile, the orchestra is playing the Valhalla motif, so they are um, falling in love more and more, and Zieglinde says, oh, if you were only the person, and suddenly the music becomes very heroic. So uh, she gets Zygmunt all excited that this might happen, and um, He's, he's looking at her and suddenly the door flies open and, and they both look and, and, and she says, is somebody there? And, and he says, um, yes, um, the spring just came into the room. Now, you can, he says, oh, well, let's just learn a couple of words because you'll love seeing this with words. <laughs> Winterstürme wichen dem Wonnemont. Okay, Winterstürme wichen dem Wonnemond. You can be sort of right. You just get the v v v thing. <laughs> okay, in mildem Lichte leuchtet der Lenz. You hear the la la la, right? So that's how all of Wagner's lyrics are composed. You can sing it on la la la. But this is uh, Siegmund's first official love song to, to Sieglinde. Stürme wichen dem Wonnemond, in mildem Lichte leuchtet der Lenz. Auf blinden Lüften, leicht und lieblich, wunderweben der Sieg fühlt. You want to all do it now that you know it? Okay. It's such a good tune. Winterstürme wichen dem Wonnemond, in mildem Lichte leuchtet der Lenz. Auf linden Lüften, leicht und lieblich, wunderweben, der sich wiegt. There's like eight words that begin with V and eight words that begin with L. Okay. Here you go. Winterstürme wichen dem Wonnemond, in mildem Lichte leuchtet der Lenz. Auf linden Lüften, leicht und lieblich, wunderweben, der sich wiegt. So this marvelous song goes on, and then we hear that love music again. All right, 
so he sings this impassioned rhapsodic love song to her and says um, uni- that, that love and spring are now united. And her uh, response to this is to sing, you, you are spring. Du bist der Lenz. Can everybody just say that? Du bist der Lenz. Yeah. If you can only sing one line of Wagner, that's a good one. Here are the lines. <laughs> du bist der Lenz, nachdem ich verlangte. You are the spring that I have longed for in frostigen winters frist. Right? In, in cold winters biting time. And, and she's in this awful marriage with Hunding, and suddenly in comes Sigmund, the hero. Du bist der Lenz, nachdem ich verlangte. In frostigen winters frist. Here we go. Ah. Du bist der Lenz, nachdem ich verlangte in frostigen winters frist. Dich grüßte mein Herz mit Heil. All right, so she sings to him about how he has changed her life and brought spring into her life, and the two of them become more and more in love and enraptured with each other. And uh, at a certain point, she says, so what is your name, really? And he (laughs) says, uh, whatever you want. And so she names him Siegmund. That's why I said he's not really Siegmund. A lot of things happen during the course of the opera. Like there's no ring at the beginning of the ring, and there's no Siegmund, even when you think Siegmund is coming on stage. So he becomes Siegmund in the course of their love duet. And uh, uh, the two of them rush off stage and conceive Siegfried, (laughs) all right? (laughs) Who is the subject of a whole nother opera. But meanwhile, of course, the all-knowing gods are very aware of what has happened, and Wotan gets in trouble again for his planning because Fricka, his wife Fricka, doesn't feel that these two should be allowed to live after committing incest. So we all know Hunding is about to fight Sigmund anyway, and um, Wotan says to Fricka, well, he did this of his own free will. And she says, oh, give me a break. You put the sword there. (laughs) You conceive the children. You put them in the house. I mean, this was a setup, if ever there was one. (laughs) And so Wotan says, well, just because your morality is so limited to, (laughs) it's just (laughs) such a marital squabble, right? Your morality is so limited. And she says, look on your spear, and you tell me what the rune said that you wrote. And he's like, oh, fuck. (laughs) So, okay, here's Wotan. He goes, I promise I will not save Sigmund. And she says, and not your Valkyries either, (laughs) because she's onto him. So he summons Brunhilde, and he says to her, you must allow Hunding to kill Sigmund. And Brunhilde says, is that what you really want? And he says, that's what I have to do. Those are the commands. Do what you got to (laughs) do. So Brunhilde visits Siegmund with Sieglinde and says, "Um, you're going to die, but I'll take Sieglinde and let her be safe. And he says, no, if you're going to take Sieglinde, um, I'm going to kill us all now because we have to be together. So either you let me live and let her live, or we both go. And Brunhilde is so overcome emotionally with the strength of Siegmund's love that she breaks her father's ostensible orders and allows Siegmund to slay Hunding in battle. Well, Wotan is furious, so he comes and shatters the sword Notung, that sword that Siegmund pulled out of the tree, Notung, 
He shatters Notung with his, with his uh, staff, and Siegmund has to die. Uh, and then Hunding, who's feeling all triumphant, is gloating when Wotan just says, and you can die too, and just <laughs> pops him out very quickly. So Hunding and Siegmund are gone, but Sieglinde and the baby Siegfried inside of her live on, and Brunhilde knows that Wotan is very angry and cannot uh, allow uh, Sieglinde to live if he's following orders. So she sends Sieglinde away with her sisters, who can't protect them the, themselves, but promise to take um, Sieglinde and the baby to a cave where Wotan doesn't go because it's right near where Fafner the dragon is. And I know, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> But Brunhilde is really trying to do what she knows her father really in his heart wants to have happen. Now, this is what you've been waiting for, I know. <laughs> yeah, the ride. Brunhilde and her eight <laughs> flying sisters. All right, so if, if you wish to um, remain seated, you may, and if you want to fly around the room. You can do that. <laughs> so, Wotan has sort of ordered a convocation of all of the sisters to um, solve this problem, have a little family conference, and they, they all come flying. <laughs> It's actually longer than you think. Come on. Uh, <laughs> this is what they grew up singing, you know. Hoya to ho, hoya to ho, hoya ha, hoya ha. in act three, okay? I just want to give you a, a friendly reminder that in real life, these operas take a lot longer. Um, I was conducting at the Vienna Chamber Opera and I wanted to see Die Valkyrie at the Staatsoper, which is, you know, a 10 minute walk away. So I went in my conducting clothes, saw act one, went and conducted my whole opera during act two, and came back in time for the ride of the Valkyries. So, you're being spoiled. This is a compressed time scale. <laughs> so the girls sing and sing and sing, and it's absolutely magnificent. And uh, Wotan shows up. And at first they try to hide Brunhilde because they know that whether he wanted her to do what, he, what she did or not, that he is only allowed to enforce the law that was written on the side of that staff he's carrying in runes by him. So the other Valkyries go away and uh, Wotan is left alone with Brunhilde. She tries to defend herself and says, I've always been your will, I've always been your right arm, I was only doing exactly what I knew your deepest self wanted to have happen. 
And he says, you cannot break those rules. So you have to give up your divinity as punishment for this transgression. And uh, she says, is there any way that you could make me not a prey to ordinary mortals? And so Wotan's concession to her is that he will put her in a ring of fire on a mountaintop. So only the bravest of mortals would ever even venture near her. So he puts her, with Logi's assistance, in a ring of magic fire. That's got some good tunes for you to sing, yeah. too. <laughs> All right, so um, magic fire has, has a couple of parts. This is the magic, not the fire. Okay, remember that. Then we have... Okay. Now, what I need is to break you up into three groups. <laughs> <laughs> all right, your group one, uh, this side is, is all group two, and everybody else is group three. Now, group one, if you would oblige me with this music. Let's have a little rehearsal. Here we go, two, three. Excellent. Group two, you're the, the fire magic. Okay, now, <clears throat> don't worry, it's all going to work out. <laughs> the magic of theater. <laughs> all right, now, I need, um, I need one other thing. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Group three. All right, now you're all going to do this at the same time, right? Here we go. And go. still standing. That was good. That was good. All right. So in the orchestration of a Wagner opera, there might be four, five light motifs all going on at the same time. Always the subjects that are being dealt with. If it's Loga bringing magic fire, and meanwhile there's the theme of the ring or the river Rhine or whatever. It's all, it's all happening. <laughs> Somebody pointed out to me I was very remiss at the end of part one because there's a beautiful song that Wotan sings to his daughter. Uh, so we're just going to touch in on that to remind us where we were in the story. <laughs> Brunhilde has requested Wotan that if he punishes her and makes her mortal, at least he could encircle her with fire. And he obliges her. And in the music, uh, that ensues, you'll hear at least four motifs that you know now already. So, and Wotan says, Leb wohl, du kühnes, herrliches Kind, du meines Herzens heiligster Stolz. Uh, Live well, my most marvelous, brave child, the, um, 
the holiest pride of my heart, right? Live for Right? Now, yeah. all of you, yeah. <laughs> With all the cookies and you sort of forgot what we were doing here. Ah. this song, he does the magic with his spear. You recognize that? Just, you know, that's how it happens. This is the music of Brunhilde telling Zygmunt he has to die. Todesverkündigung. So that gives you more, <laughs> that gives you a tiny idea of the kind of time scale Wagner uses all the time, right? It's much more stretched out and you saw me flip through seven pages. So um, it's that, that by creating the opera house in Bayreuth, he felt that if you took people away from their daily cares, they could go into a completely different state and immerse themselves in a theater production, uh, in the ideas of his drama, in the art, uh, without the distractions of the outside world. And, you know, that, that's a very daring experiment. Nobody had tried to do something like that, and it was, of course, successful, uh, partly because King Ludwig II was willing to uh, <laughs> finance the project, but, uh, he, you know, Ludwig had been a huge fan of Wagner since he was a boy. And um, I think that he felt uh, completely, uh, he was very enthusiastic about, about doing that. He just, he found it was a, a perfect match. So um, we know now that the child that was conceived by Siegmund and Sieglinde, uh, Siegfried, was left in that cave somewhere near where the dragon Fafner, oh, I didn't mention that, that Fafner the giant turns himself into Fafner the dragon. Uh, 
so that he can guard the treasure most effectively. And um, Siegfried is growing up. He's an adolescent boy, but he's, of course, no ordinary adolescent boy. And the person who has raised him is the best smith, best metalsmith among the dwarves, and this is Alberich's brother, Mima. Okay, so Mima is always uh, at the anvil, and so we hear that music, I don't know if you remember. That's good for you. So when, when dwarves are forging metal in this opera, we always hear, hear that music. But then a much purer, clearer music comes out as Siegfried comes running on stage. Hey, ho! The real tenors sound so good. <laughs> All right, he is um, playing. He's found an animal playmate, a full-grown bear. And uh, he comes running onto stage with this bear, which terrifies poor old Mima. But uh, Siegfried, who's by now sung up to a high C and put this bear into submission, uh, is, is clearly quite an extraordinary kid. And he's also a handful. He's a handful for Mima. Now, Siegfried's um, christening present, as it were, was the broken pieces of Notung, the sword because when Wotan smashed Notung with his spear, um, Brunhilde picked up the pieces and they went with Sieglinde to the cave. So um, this, this sword cannot be forged back into a sword. Mima, who is the best dwarf smith, and the dwarves are the smiths of the world, um, can't get these pieces back together. So um, let's see. There's a lot of the ring that we have to skip, and I'm really sorry. But Wotan now disguises himself as a wanderer and comes down to uh, Mima and inquires who, who is the boy, and of course he knows all, they both know all the answers, but this is for the audiences who might have missed the first two nights of the ring. So there's a sort of, you know when you watch, um, uh, any of those things on, on TV, blue uh, wh white collar, and it says, in this week's episode, and it, it flashes all the scenes uh, of the last four weeks in, encapsulated in two minutes. That's what Wagner does at the beginning of the third and fourth operas of, of The Ring. In more than two minutes, but in Wagner time. You know, it's very short. <laughs> and um, it lets the audience know that, yes, Siegfried is now the chosen one and Wotan is planning to have Siegfried murder the dragon, Fafner, and get that ring. Because the curse on the ring is that everybody, when they don't have it, can think of nothing else but owning it. All right, so. Um, Notung is the sword, right? No, we gotta do the song. Oh, you gotta do the song, okay. All right, so. <laughs> All right, we'll do the song. Um, but <laughs> Mima somehow knows that the sword is called Notung, and, and um, Siegfried has heard this too, but uh, he, he's tried it. Let's see. Notung. This is before the song. And, and uh, Siegfried doesn't quite understand what's being asked of him. But um, the point here, hang on. Okay, the point is that even across a generation, Siegfried miraculously, when he starts to sing about Notung, sings exactly what his father sang. <laughs> Notung, notung, neidliches Schwert. In any range you find comfortable. <laughs> Here we go. Notung, notung, neidliches Schwert. Was müsstest du zerspringen? So he, he knows that it's important that he forge this sword and um, 
what he, he does, uh, Siegfried does, is goes out into the world and brings home some wood. And he sets the wood on fire to um, put under the metal. And what we learn is that Siegfried casually, without, inst without um, knowing it consciously, goes to the world ash tree and takes some wood from that and sets it on fire. And uh, so suddenly we have this uh, supernatural blaze. So he's forging this sword that was unforgeable to anybody else. And at the end of act one, uh, we hear the triumphant music of Siegfried. the sword, he runs off with his sword. And now we go to the dragon's lair and uh, the two brothers meet, Mima and Alberich. They both know that Wotan has destined that Siegfried will be able to kill the dragon. So they're both waiting outside the cave when Siegfried emerges to see who's going to snatch that ring from him. And Mima decides he's going to offer Siegfried a triumphant drink, which of course he's going to poison so that Siegfried will drink the drink and uh, Mima will take the ring and go away. Uh, Siegfried encounters the dragon and within moments he's slain him right into the heart and uh, comes out and Mima offers him this and it, somehow Siegfried knows. How does Siegfried know? When he kills the dragon, a little bit of uh, dragon blood goes onto his fingers and he sticks his fingers in his mouth and suddenly he's able to understand a lot about the world that he didn't know before. <laughs> he's not innocent anymore. He can understand the language of animals and he can certainly understand what Mima has in mind when he offers him this drink. So he kills Mima with Notung on the spot. <laughs> we don't feel bad for Mima. <laughs> Not to tell you how to feel, but I mean really, Mima is just... All right. Uh, we don't feel bad for Fafner either. <laughs> The, the bird. You all know about that bird. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything important before the bird. All right. So Siegfried has his treasure, but to him it's, it's nothing special until a bird begins to sing. No, I'm getting there too fast. You don't want to know about that. You want to hear his horn call. Can you all do that? Now you'll recognize this theme. So we have Siegfried and we have the destiny of the ring all together. Siegfried, now having tasted dragon's blood, hears the wood bird. Hi, Siegfried gehört nun den Nibelungen Hort. Oh, fänd ich in Höhle den Hort er jetzt. Wollte den Tarnhelm winnen und der Tag in den Wonniger Tat. Doch wollte er den Ring sich erraten, Der macht ihn zum Walter der Wahl. The, the woodbird says, he can take the Tarnhelm, but if he takes the ring, it will make him the ruler of the world. Now Siegfried is the only person in this opera who isn't interested in being the ruler of the world. That's not <laughs> on his radar. What's, what's interesting to Siegfried is that Mima has told him that there is this thing called fear. 
Mima feels it all the time. And he says, don't you ever experience that? And, and Siegfried says, I don't know, what does it feel like? And Mima says, well, you sort of shudder and your heart isn't beating quite right and you stammer and you don't feel confident. And Siegfried says, nope, don't know about that. <laughs> and, and Mima says, when you f try to slay the dragon Fafner, you will know it. And Siegfried comes out of that cave, doesn't know any more about fear than he knew when he went in. He just does his job. But somehow tasting this uh, blood, although it doesn't lead him to experience fear, leads him to be open to a wider range of experiences. So um, Siegfried takes the ring and he takes the Tarnhelm and the woodbird sings. Ay, Siegfried gehört nun den Helm und der Ring. O traute er mir den Treulosen nicht. Hörte Siegfried nur scharf auf den Schelmen Heuchlergerät. Wie sein Herz es meint, kann er Mime verstehen. So nützt ihm das Blut des Genuss. So he's, the, the woodbird is telling Siegfried not to, to trust Mima. I forgot to say that. That's how Siegfried knows that Mima means no good. Okay. Um, so much. What? Okay, here's what's important. Um, we all know that the reason Wotan encircled Brunhilde with fire is because the only person, mortal, part, quarter, quarter divine, three-quarter mortal, who um, will, well, no, I guess half and half, right? Uh, so uh, who, who will find her there is Siegfried himself. And at the end of uh, the opera, Siegfried, he goes, finds the ring of fire, and um, just springs through it and looks at this figure on the ground who's still in armor, of course, because that was Brunhilde's day clothing. And um, <laughs> he says, ah, das ist kein Mann. That is not a guy. A and uh, he, he, he awakens her with a kiss and he's, he says, for the first time, I know the feeling that's fear. So he has this uh, awakening, this emotional awakening, and uh, Brunhilde, of, of course, wakes up to the tune of the prelude of Goethe Dämmerung. And immediately realizes that it's Siegfried because this has been prophesied, she's heard about it, and uh, pretty soon they are deeply in love and she's singing this marvelous love duet with him, which I don't think we should even... Um, <laughs> <laughs> attempt, because it's very high. <laughs> but needless to say, Siegfried and Brunhilde pick up where they left off at the beginning of Goethe Dämmerung. But before, before the story gets going in this fourth and final opera, Wagner introduces us to the Norns the three Norns who are weaving the threads of life and know everything that has happened, is happening, and is going to happen. And a thread breaks, and they realize that something is going to happen to the gods, that the gods are not going to continue as they have. The opening of Goethe Dämmerung is the music of Brunhilde's awakening, but transformed, and here's the rhyme. of you that have heard Goethe Dämmerung knows that the orchestra plays it much more slowly than that. But you can create a lot of sound effects with an orchestra. Um, so that's, that's why I'm not doing it at that kind of tempo. Um, all right, so Brunhilde and Siegfried, as promised, deeply in love. You have to say, when Wagner writes a love theme, you never wonder if it's something else, right? I mean, <laughs> it's so marvelous.
Brunhilde. Zu neun. Wow. Den teurer Helde. Wie liebt ich dich? Lieb ich dich nicht? Okay. So, we know that this uh, love of theirs is the love between two people who are half and formerly <laughs> divine. So um, it's more than an ordinary human love. And uh, the world knows about them. Nicht sich ich freit, ach dich nicht mehr. The heroism that, that they bring to the world doesn't go unnoticed. So Alberich, remember Alberich, the dwarf who started all of this? He has a son named Hagen. And Hagen is a Gibichung because he has associated himself with this family. And uh, he has a half brother named Gunther. And Gunther has a wife named uh, Gutruna. Sister named Gutruna. Thanks, I'm getting tired. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad you all know your father. <laughs> so Gutruna and Gunther both think it's time for them to get married. And who better to get married to than Gunther to the marvelous Brunhilde and um, Gutruna to the wonderful Siegfried. So how will this be accomplished? Well, Hagen, who has all of his father's evil blood in his veins, has a plan. And the plan involves giving Siegfried a magical drink that will cause him to forget everything that has happened in his life up to this point. Uh, and it, it works. So Siegfried doesn't remember that he's Brunhilde's beloved. He uh, becomes a blood brother with Gutrun, uh, Gunther, and um, he says, uh, what, what do you need? I'll do anything for you. And uh, Gunther says, well, win that Brunhilde woman for me. And uh, Siegfried does, obligingly brings Brunhilde to Gunther, and uh, meanwhile, because he's completely forgotten that he was married to her, he uh, agrees to marry Gutruna. Uh, now, just a little footnote here. Um, <laughs> this might seem very strange. <laughs> Nothing in the ring that Wagner writes happens accidentally. <clears throat> Although he drew on medieval sources, he changed them very freely. And if it didn't suit what he wanted to say, it isn't in here. So, really, Wagner, who was quite uh, a libertine himself, um, is exploring the possibilities uh, of how we should perhaps uh, regard men having different partners in a different way. First, there's Wotan, who just has the sort of ultimate droit du seigneur. Uh, <laughs> but then there's uh, Siegfried, who takes a potion and, oh, I just forgot. And, <laughs> Right? So metaphorically, really, metaphorically, Wagner is saying, you know, if, if, if the circumstances are what they are and that magic happens, you just forget. You just don't remember. And, and um, I think that, that, you know, ultimately in the ring, well, I'll tell you what happens in a few minutes. But so, so this all comes to pass. And uh, meanwhile, Hagen says, um, to Brunhilde, who of course hasn't forgotten anything, uh, <laughs> don't you want to avenge yourself on Siegfried? And she's so enraged because their love was so important to her, and of course to Siegfried too, but he doesn't remember that, that he, she gives away Siegfried's secret. She protected his body with magic charms so that he could never be harmed, but she never bothered to do anything to his back because she knows Siegfried and he would never turn his back in any battle situation, so it was unnecessary. A waste of potion, I guess, I don't know. But she didn't do it. So she tells Hagen this, and Hagen, of course, stabs Siegfried in the back, and Siegfried dies. And uh, at that moment, as he's dying, um, Hagen gives him an antidote so that he can remember everything. And, right? and so suddenly, Siegfried, who doesn't remember the Gutruna part is just truly in love with Brunhilde as he has been from the beginning. And um, Brunhilde realizes everything that's happened. Now, what happened to the ring? <laughs> Brunhilde had that ring and wouldn't give it up 
because that's part of the curse of the ring. In her case, it wasn't that she wanted world domination, but she felt that Siegfried had given it to her and that their love was stronger than anything else in the world, so she wouldn't give that ring up. And now at this point, uh, Siegfried has the ring and he almost gave it up to the Rhine maidens, but in the end he didn't because that curse is more powerful than any being, be they divine or mortal, can overcome. So, uh, Brunhilde now does the right thing. <laughs> she, let me find the good music. We need a score for this. Brunhilde builds an enormous funeral pyre. And we'll be there in a moment. Mm. Oh, these are Siegfried's dying words. This is the open, this is the, the, the music that he awakened her with in the first place and the music that opened Gerda Demerol. Brunhilde. Okay. So, finally they have that recognition, and here's his funeral march, or a little bit of it. You've heard this? Was their parents, right? Du bist der Land. So Brunhilde then gets on Grana, Grana the horse, and rides in to the fire. But of course she can still sing for about 15 minutes. <laughs> rides in and the Rhine actually begins to overflow its banks and the Rhine maidens come up and uh, the ring, which Brunhilde now has, uh, returns to the Rhine maidens where it belonged at the very beginning. And Hagen, who is still under the curse of the ring, throws himself into the Rhine to try to get the ring. But the Rhine maidens pull him deep down under the Rhine and he drowns. So we now have several motifs coming together at the end of Goethe Demon. <clears throat> How shall we do this? First we have the uh, Rhine Maidens. And then Valhalla on top of that. And 
the Rhine maidens. Now, what's that fabulous tune? Right? That is redemption through love. And all great Wagner operas have as their theme redemption through love, be it Tannhäuser or Lohengrin. So uh, finally, Brunhilde was the first person who was able to do the thing that the universe needed, <laughs> to, to have the ring return to the Rhine. Now, the gods no longer exist the way they existed before. Wagner, very purposefully, creates a new world where Valhalla is destroyed. It's the Götterdämmerung, it's the twilight of the gods, and we amazing but imperfect things are left to uh, make the best of the universe that used to be inhabited by Wotan and Fricke and Donner and Fro and Freya. So uh, this redemption by love is the final word of Goethe Demerung. <laughs> However, while that's happening, we have the Rhine Maidens music and the Valhalla music happening at the same time. So now I'll put it all together. the music of the end of the gods. This is it. Redemption through love. If there's anything you didn't get to sing, we can do it now. <laughs> huh? Forest murmurs. Forest murmurs. Well, we can't really sing that. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or things they want to share about their, their Wagner experience? Yes, ma'am. Always. Always. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Women are just as fabulous. So whatever horrible things we could say about Wagner, I think it's really important to say that this man in the 19th century really got it. 
He got that. And you know what? It's essentially Wagner knowing that about himself that makes redemption such a feature in his works. I mean, it, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there are a lot of shabby people, but not all of them can write stuff like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, so I guess that, that Wagner, the, the genius part is extraordinary and, and whatever part of him uh, was able to not only write this music but write this drama and create a whole new art form essentially, uh, you know, it did, did very well know that about himself and, uh, and, and I think that from the earliest, uh, you know, Dutchman, or the, the opera where um, at the end the woman throws herself, Senta throws herself into the water to save the soul of the Dutchman, and uh, you know Elizabeth does it, and Elsa does it, and um, of course Isolde does it, and so uh, we can only think that that Wagner felt he had to work really hard <laughs> to, <laughs> to save himself, <laughs> but but he succeeds in the end. He succeeds, right? Thank you. That's exactly right. It's wonderful. Well, thank you all. I don't know if if, if there's enough um, interest, we can do this with other <laughs> operas down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>